Hello and welcome to the Modern Adventurer podcast. Coming up. Lady, maybe 60 or 70 years old with long braids, dressed in a traditional style with a beautiful woven cap. And she's smiling at me and she's welcoming me with some bread and some milk. And then there's her husband, you know, this elderly gentleman who's standing there with his like Pakistani pakul, this sort of traditional hat. And they're just welcoming me, this stranger, into their home. They never, they didn't know me before. I didn't know them before. And yet here they are standing there with a smile, not speaking a word of English, me not speaking a word of their language and just expecting me to come in, just come in. You're our guest, come in, take a bite of this bread, take a sip of this milk and stay with us for a while. And I think this kind of like warmth and hospitality is something that I've experienced in so many places. But I think Pakistan was really the place that kind of introduced me to to that concept, which I think is quite alien to us in the sort of Western world. My next guest is Ava Zubek, a YouTuber who has covered a wide range of countries in her time. She, let's say, doesn't quite stick to the travel destinations you see in the brochure. She goes off the beaten track and tells some of the most fantastic stories in the most authentic way. From Pakistan to the Yemen, Iraq to Mongolia. So I am delighted to introduce Ava Zubek to the podcast. Thank you so much. Really happy to be here. Well, absolute pleasure. And thank you so much for coming on. Uh, What I absolutely love about your story is I suppose how you travel to countries which some people might question your logic and would probably, they're not your typical holiday destinations and you tell it in such a authentic and positive manner. Uh, We'll get into that in a minute, but I suppose probably the best place to start for people listening is about you and how you started in this sort of world of adventures and travel. Yeah. I mean, obviously, sometimes you're, you know, we're all very tempted to look at vloggers or filmmakers, uh, whatever you want to call them, content creators, and sort of look at their current stage and be like, oh, well, they must have always done this filmmaking thing. They must have always done this travel thing. They've always been good at it. That's definitely not my story. (laughs) My story is actually of, of, um, yeah, definitely struggle and new beginnings. So just over three years ago, I was not living this kind of life. Um, I was uh, working for a startup back in London. I was married, working very long hours in the city, kind of like going through the motions that I think a lot of people find themselves almost like locked in or like shackled to. You know, you graduate university with a good degree and then you have to go to the city to get a good job and, you know, earn good money, climb the career ladder and eventually, you know, find a husband or a wife or, you know, I don't know, have a family, do whatever you need to do. And uh, that's kind of your life, right? And I was definitely on that path, um, yeah, just over three years ago in London, until I kind of started questioning why I found it difficult to get out of bed in the morning and why I didn't have much motivation to do anything outside of my job. And even, you know, doing my job on a daily basis was a bit of a struggle. I had to find reasons to convince myself why, um, you know, I was, I, I, should live the kind of life that everybody had been telling me to live. And um, so I sort of questioned myself kind of low-key for a little while until I came to a few sort of very deep um, realizations um, after asking myself these tough questions that actually maybe this was not the life that I wanted to live. Maybe I had just kind of fallen for this illusion of success that everybody told me I should aspire to. And the moment I realized that was kind of the moment of truth where I was like, well, this is clearly not for me. So what should I do about it? I mean, you have limited options in some ways because you can either keep going and be unhappy, maybe for the rest of your life, who knows, or quit and do something completely new and different and have zero guarantees that it will work out. Um, So I thought, well, I'm still I'm still kind of young. But that doesn't even matter so much. I guess, like, I just don't really, I can't picture myself being unhappy for one more month of my life. So um, in a pretty spontaneous decision, (laughs) um, in pretty much actually one morning between 8 a.m. and 10 
a.m. on the 1st of January 2018, I did a whole bunch of things that completely changed my life in like one moment. I quit my job in London, my very nice cushy job. I gave up my apartment in London. I called my family to tell them that I'm going traveling full time. <laughs> By the way, I had no plans as to what I would be doing on those travels just yet. And I booked a one-way ticket to Nepal because I thought, where should I go? I mean, on my sort of solo travels. Uh, and Nepal sounds like a place where I could get some spiritual awakening. So I'll, I guess I'll just go there. You know, I think I've, I've seen too many sort of movies about mountains, the Himalayas and uh, sort of spiritual reawakenings. So I um, booked those tickets. And a couple of months later, I was actually on my way to Nepal with a camera in hand, um, thinking that I'd like to start documenting my travels, despite the fact that I had no background at all in filmmaking or, or vlogging or anything like that. But I thought, okay, I'm gonna go and travel for a little while. I don't know how long, I don't know where, but I'd like to share that story of like a journey into the unknown um, with people in a creative way. So um, yeah, kind of on that trip along the way, I started learning how to edit videos from scratch via sort of YouTube University. Um, I started kind of trying to build out my Instagram, didn't really know what I was doing. <laughs> and um, yeah, I kind of, I wanted to see what I could do with this limited savings that I had from my previous job um, and how I can tell sort of the story of a solo female traveler kind of making her way around the world after quitting her old life in you know in London so that's kind of how it all began and now we're here three years on and things are kind of working out <laughs> <laughs> no it's absolutely amazing and uh, for people listening Ava has a remarkable way of communicating her story on sort of YouTube and Instagram so you were in Nepal how long were you there for <laughs> Nepal was my very first destination um, and it was only really to do a uh, sort of trek to Everest base camp. Mind you, at that point, I hadn't really stepped foot on like, like in the mountains very much in a very, very long time. I was definitely like full on city girl, you know, like I went to Nepal with like uh, face powder, with mascara, with all these things, thinking, oh my God, like, how am I going to look like out on these mountains? I need to make sure that I look, you know, great. And, and then I sort of got to the mountains, got to Nepal and I was like, well, I can't, I can't possibly be bringing all these things with me on the Everest base camp trek. I have to ditch them, you know? And that was kind of like, I don't know. I felt like I was reborn almost in some in some interesting new way and that was like definitely a very transformative um kind of cut with my old life um but i think the journey that definitely um changed the way that i sort of looked at my future journey the way that i looked at the world and a journey that really triggered everything that i do with my content with the destinations that i travel to now was the second country i traveled to which was pakistan <laughs> So this is um, one of the sort of less obvious countries that you were talking about. And Pakistan um, was the second destination on kind of my, my big journey. Came about completely randomly. So when a friend, uh, an old school friend, heard that I was, you know, traveling the world and telling travel stories, she said, OK, well, why don't you come over to Pakistan? You know, I'm here. Um, I'm, I'm living here. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, Pakistan, you like she's, you know, this like tiny blonde girl with blue eyes, really sweet and gentle. And I was like, you, you really you you're in Pakistan. Like that doesn't seem like the kind of place that you would travel to. She's like, no, no, no. It's completely different from what you expect. Come over. You'll see for yourself. So I got my visa, I got my ticket. And then from Nepal, I flew to Pakistan. And I was like, oh my God, where am I going? Pakistan, I've heard so much about Pakistan. Only bad things, right? You hear about these countries like, oh God, there's violence, there's terrorism. Like you imagine things like people on the streets just have like guns with them and there's probably not much to see. And so I was imagining all these things, repeating these sort of like media narratives that we hear in our daily lives. Um, in my head as I was boarding the flight to Islamabad in Pakistan. And um, uh, yeah, landed and within maybe an hour, my entire perception of not just Pakistan, but the world and life, <laughs> if I may exaggerate a little bit, 
changed just almost instantly. I landed expecting to visit some sort of um, war zone with very little to see. And I found a city that was lined with beautiful green trees, um, nice cars, nice people who were smiling at me, not carrying guns. Um, and um, I just realized, oh my God, maybe I was wrong about this place. And then I stayed in Pakistan for a couple of weeks, traveling to the north, which is a very beautiful mountainous region, some of the tallest mountains in the world, amazing nature, valleys, really kind people, interesting culture. And spending two weeks, just the sort of initial two weeks there, made me reconsider how I viewed the world and why I had viewed the world in those ways. Um, you know, kind of having succumbed to all the like sort of negative biases and stereotypes that um, I had been exposed to through sort of mainstream media and never really having questioned them before. Until, of course, I experienced them on my own skin and the fact that they just were not true. Um, and so <laughs> my two week uh, adventure with Pakistan turned into um, a one year long stay in Pakistan. I ended up staying for a year, um, traveling all across the country, making videos um, about, you know, sort of travel, culture, food uh, in Pakistan. And that was the real beginning, I would say, of the journey. And that's what brought me here. Wow. And I suppose what, what I loved is probably when you went out to Pakistan, as you said, the media ta tabloids, especially around that sort of time, were probably just full of horror stories. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, your parents and friends and family were were convincing <laughs> you left, right and center to <laughs> to abandon this idea that you had, this oh crazy idea. Oh, my God. I mean, the things I heard, <laughs> um, they definitely, I mean, my family and friends definitely thought I was probably a little bit mad by that point because I had quit everything you know back in London and then next thing they know I'm traveling to Pakistan of all places so they definitely had some serious questions and uh, I'm not surprised of course um, I would probably do the same for my friends but um, but it was definitely an unusual decision and um, the thing is that you know the longer I stayed in Pakistan the more they worried the more passionate I became about sort of telling them and showing them just how beautiful and different it was to what maybe they were also kind of expecting and what they had been imagining so um it definitely in very interesting ways it was also a journey like it was a journey for me in sort of creating um content on sort of public platforms like youtube and instagram about this amazing place uh but also kind of a more personal journey into trying to convince my family that not only was i making the right decision by um, you know, quitting my job in London and pursuing something completely new and different and very sort of risky in a sense that there was no guarantees that I would succeed, but also then going to places like that as a solo female traveler. Um, and I think that was something that worried them the most. But that was also the kind of niche that I was the most passionate about. What, what was the sort of moment that you had there where you were like, this, this is one of the best moments of my life? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Where do I begin? Um, I think, mm, oh gosh, for example, I made a couple of unexpected friends um, up sort of north, uh, in, in the north of Pakistan, in the mountains, through just some common friends. I had been invited to stay um, in a sort of remote valley uh, in the north, in the mountains for as long as I wanted. So I kind of drove up there without really knowing uh, much about the region without really knowing anyone there and I would only get to sort of meet the family that would be hosting me when I got there I didn't even get a chance to sort of talk to them on the phone or anything before so I was kind of going a little bit into the unknown and the moment they sort of you know I mean I arrived like driving down the sort of beautiful Karakoram highway which is one of the most stunning I think roads in the entire world just takes you through these gorgeous mountains um and um you know it took oh gosh like a day and a half to actually reach the village that I had been invited to stay in um reach the village which was just you know underneath this huge mountain face um overlooking the the Hindu Kush and the Karakoram mountains and um entered the home of a family that was sort of native to the region uh part of the Wahi community 
who you know have their own language, their own customs, very separate from the rest of Pakistan. And I enter their house and there's only a couple of rooms in the house. In the main room where most of the family members sleep, there's a Buhari, which is like a, a sort of very basic stove. There's a fire inside, it's nice and warm. There's carpets all over the walls. Um, there's a beautiful sort of ceiling that's carved in wood. And inside there's this, family this older lady maybe 60 or 70 years old with long braids dressed in a traditional style with a beautiful woven cap and she's smiling at me and she's welcoming me with some bread and some milk and then there's her husband you know this elderly gentleman who's standing there with his like Pakistani pakul this sort of traditional hat and they're just welcoming me this stranger into their home they never they didn't know me before i didn't know them before and yet here they are standing there with a smile not speaking a word of english me not speaking a word of their language and just expecting me to come in just come in you're our guest come in take a bite of this bread take a sip of this milk and stay with us for a while and i think this kind of like warmth and hospitality is something that i've experienced in so many places but i think pakistan was really the place that kind of introduced me to to that concept, which I think is quite alien to us in the sort of Western world. We, we don't have this, I mean, for example, in, in Poland, where I'm from, we kind of culturally pride ourselves on being hospitable and, wel and welcoming. But it, it's not really, it's maybe a concept that existed once upon a time, but that I don't think no longer applies as much and that we don't see it in practice as much. We're not as trusting of strangers anymore. Maybe at some point we were. But out there in Pakistan and so many other places that I've visited, there is definitely that sense that, oh, you're our guest. Come and share our home with us. Come and share our food with us. And um, yeah, that's definitely been like the, I would say, the, the most beautiful mm, experience or set of experiences that I've collected on my travels is this kind of the hospitality that I've experienced has just been absolutely mind-blowing. <laughs> yeah, I think um, when you travel, that is the one thing you always take is the unbelievable hospitality that you get in some of these countries. And ones that um, you would not expect at all. I, I remember, it reminds me of a sort of time when we were traveling through Turkey and we were up in Mount Ararat which um, I think is famous for where Noah's Ark less, less rested or something, <laughs> something along those lines. <laughs> and anyway, we were driving up, I think, to camp for the night and we came across a sort of shepherd's hut. And as we drove in, we were like, oh, shh, it's someone's place. Let's, um, let's turn around. And they're like, no, 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 come on in. You know, this little uh, bell tent in the middle of the mountain, you know, the last bit on the road you would no one would ever m go up there and they were like come on in come and have some eggs um so we sort of sat down in their tent the stove was on they cooked us some eggs and you know and then we went on the went on our way afterwards and you know we didn't speak a word we couldn't understand a word that they were saying but it is this sort of hospitality and this generosity that comes back again and again and again when you travel mm. and i think i find a lot of that hospitality um you experience it in some of the places that have some of the worst reputations for kind yep. of other human beings you know again pakistan i think for a lot of people who don't know much about the country the first association would be of you know oh, something terrible will happen to me if i go there and not oh well wait hang on maybe someone will welcome me into their home um, you know, with bread and milk. <laughs> That's kind of not what we imagine, is it? And it's um, it's really interesting that kind of dissonance um, that you experience of kind of the perceived world and the world that you actually end up experiencing with your own kind of senses. And it's almost quite difficult to try and convince people because even when you tell them of these experiences, they're like, no, no, that's not true. <laughs> yeah, and like, no, no, I, I've been... And I remember sort of talking about this to someone um, and they're like, no, that, that place is very dangerous. And you're like, well, <laughs> yeah, I'm sure there are elements of this place which are dangerous, but the vast majority of the people there are kind, 
they're welcoming, they're, they're there with a smile. Nope, yeah. nope, nope. <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can't convince everybody, you know. You've got to pick your battles. <laughs> and I suppose from Pakistan, then you were sort of traveling around Iraq and you've recently, you were in the Yemen when this whole pandemic sort of kicked off last year. That's a... what, what, was the idea, what was the idea with the Yemen? That's a great story because there was no specific idea. There was, it, it, this story came about as, you know, a complete coincidence and a product of the circumstances of the time. So I think probably everybody remembers what they were doing more or less when the pandemic was announced in March 2020. Um, and I remember distinctly that moment because at that time I was in Socotra Island in Yemen. Um, it's an island off the coast of Yemen. Uh, it's very, it's very remote, very difficult to get to. There's only like one flight per week, um, and it's you know there isn't that much infrastructure. There's only like one town with kind of basic amenities, but um, the island is quite wild and quite mountainous. Uh, amazing ecosystem, uh, loads of endemic species. It's a really unique, beautiful place. And uh, it was actually my second visit there. I went there to run a marathon which I ran in a, in a really god awful time. It was horrible. It took me like six hours. I hadn't done zero training beforehand. Terrible. Anyway, um, so uh, the point is that we were there with a group of people, marathon runners, right? And then a couple of days into our trip, uh, because we had been offline, there was no, there was no cell reception there. Um, at some point in the night, I think around 3 a.m., we sort of see lights and we hear a motorbike approaching our camp and suddenly we get knocks on our tent doors. And it turns out that the person who had arrived on the motorbike was telling us, guys, there's a pandemic. We're like, pandemic? What? This COVID thing has turned into pandemic? And they're like, yeah, 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 it's a pandemic. So the whole world is shutting down. Like countries are closing their borders. We're like, what is going on? Like this was all news to us. And they're like, yeah, yeah, and they've just sent a plane to Socotra, so you can't leave. Like, I mean, you, um, the plane that was meant to come in a week's time is coming in like four hours. So you better, you know, pack your stuff and, and go to the airport if you want to leave and go home. So everybody is obviously like in huge panic mode. Nobody knows what's going on. I'm thinking like, where, like I, I go where? Like, go home where? I don't have a home. Like, I travel full time. I don't have an apartment. My family's scattered all around the place. Like. What, what am I going to do? So I had this idea come up in my head and I was like, maybe I can stay. Maybe, maybe I could stay. It sounds radical, but maybe I could just stay and wait it out and see what happens. You know, my, my boyfriend was with me at the time and unfortunately he was like, that's well, I, I can't really stay with you because, you know, my laptop's broken. Um, I like lost my credit card. Yeah, so much happened before that trip. He was like, well, I kind of have to go back home to Canada if I can. And I couldn't at that point go to Canada. So I was like, well, I guess I'll just stay. So I said goodbye to him and I said goodbye to the rest of the group. And I watched the airplane leave the island from the airport as I stood there alone with just a couple of other, you know, mad people who decided to stay. <laughs> and that was kind of the beginning of it all. Um, Socotra Island um, <laughs> became my home for the next three months. So as the entire world was in lockdown, people were unable to leave their houses and, you know, the pandemic was, we we're still trying to figure out what it all meant. I was on this remote island in the middle of the Arabian Sea with a couple of people that I knew, um, you know, just like living a very simple, basic life and trying to wait it out and see how everything turns out. So yeah, after three months of kind of roaming around the island, you know, sleeping under the stars and... Um, you know, eating like a very healthy local diet of just like milk and bread and cheese. Um, and, you know, so many amazing adventures. Um, I eventually made my way back to Europe on a cargo ship. Um, and that's maybe a story for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but shameless plug, it's all on my YouTube channel. So if you want to <laughs> check it out, it's there. <laughs> a cargo ship? Yes. What, going all the way around through the Suez? No, no, no. Thankfully not. We were on the ship for a week um, and it took us from Socotra Island to um, the United Arab Emirates. So we then, we sort of arrived in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we parked there for another week as we were being quarantined. And then from there, I flew to Europe. <laughs> 
What was it like being on a cargo ship for a week? <laughs> it's an excellent adventure, actually. It's beautiful for like clearing your mind. <laughs> you know, you're because on I, the- can't, mm-hmm. I can't imagine there's much to do. Cargo right. ships are pretty bland. You know, okay, the, the amazing thing is that there was Wi Fi. Yeah, there, okay. there was a little bit of Wi-Fi, like just enough to kind of communicate on WhatsApp. But the rest of the time, yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you're kind of meditating <laughs> on board. You're um, reading books, you're writing. That's, a, that's how I kind of filled my time. I had like developed a tiny little routine where I would journal every morning, read a book a day pretty much, and sort of just look out, you know, on the ocean and kind of process everything that had happened over the previous three months. And that was, I mean, obviously a very light, Life, very sort of intense life experience, as you can probably imagine. Um, so I think I needed that time to process. So I didn't complain much about being on the cargo ship. Honestly, it was a great adventure. And I would definitely do it again. <laughs> when, when, when you decided to stay behind, did you ever imagine that you would be there for three months? Or did you think, I probably like quite a few people, that this might be a month, maybe two? Yeah, I thought maybe two months. I thought, nah, like... They're like, it's going to blow over, you know, like the world can't stay <laughs> shut down because we never experienced anything like that before in our lives. Right. So no. you're like, you've no idea what to expect. And I was like, no, no, no. It's like, it will be fine. They'll figure it out. You know, politicians, whatever. And um, yeah, <laughs> but, but like as two months went by, I was like, oh, sh- wait, <laughs> this is <laughs> this is uh, becoming a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, kind of I, I also knew that I had to find a way to leave the island before the monsoon season, because as soon as the monsoon season kicks in, which is around July, um, the island actually becomes cut off from the world for about four months. There's no natural port on the island. So ships cannot actually dock on the island for, for the entire summer. Um, and there were no planes. so There was no way to actually leave the island. So I, I think we left on one of the very, like on the penultimate cargo ship that had arrived on the island. So we were very lucky. And did you manage to do um, a bit of traveling in the last year? Yeah. So this is the, the thing about sort of COVID is that I think there's this preconception that it's impossible to travel. I don't think it's impossible. I think it's difficult and costly. Uh, and you have to be careful, but it is possible. So, of course, I uh, over the last year, I wasn't traveling to as many different places as I, as I would normally. And I think that was a good thing because I got to sort of explore uh, the part of the world that, you know, my family is from originally. So Eastern Europe, um, I spent, I think, two months in Romania. Um, I cycled across Poland um, in a feat of unimaginable foolishness and foolhardiness. <laughs> Again, with no training, <laughs> imagine that. Um, but, um, you know, I sort of got a chance to travel a little bit more slowly. And then, you know, as sort of things are opening up now, I've started to kind of expand towards Asia again. So hopefully, um, hopefully COVID will, well, this kind of situation as it is developing with all the vaccines and stuff, will actually be able to travel a little bit more in the near future. <laughs> this no training thing seems to be a theme. I oh got. I know, right? Oh my god! I have to stop, and that's why I decided to run an ultra marathon, <laughs> so that I actually I have to train. Otherwise, it'll just be struggle, pain, and potentially death um, when I actually do it. <laughs> and you do you're doing this ultra marathon in Mongolia? That's it. Yeah, exactly. Two hundred and fifty kilometers uh, in Mongolia. <laughs> and it's the plan to record it on your GoPro as you're going. Watching. Ab- absolutely <laughs> of course you'll see all the blood sweat and tears 100 percent guaranteed <laughs> well there shouldn't be too much blood i mean uh only blisters on the feet i imagine going through the gobi desert <laughs> thanks I, that's kind of the image i was avoiding explicitly in my own head <laughs> and what was the reason for mongolia so mongolia also holds a very very special place in my heart Um, Again, not a very obvious destination, not a place that you would necessarily consider for your next kind of, you know, um, holiday. But uh, Mongolia uh, was kind of also like a bit of a cathartic spot for me because I traveled to Mongolia as I was kind of going through this 
whole like questioning phase when I was you know living in London I was asking myself what am I doing with my life so I traveled to Mongolia on the sort of like very sort of almost cliche Trans-Siberian train right went to Mongolia and then stopped there and then went horse riding there and kind of like realized that, oh my god nature is so beautiful so peaceful and that that was also that was just like one other data point in my kind of decision to um, live a very different kind of life so then I came back to Mongolia a couple of times in the last three years and uh, most notably I would say on my latest trip there I um, decided that I wanted to um, trek a uh, horse trek in Mongolia on my own so um, I bought two horses from a couple of friends that I knew there and spent a little while sort of learning how to uh, survive with horses in the wild from the sort of local Mongolian horsemen. They taught me how to like, you know, knot the ropes and how to make knots and how to secure the horses, and how to feed them and how to water them and all these things. And um, then and then I sort of just, I, I guess I got on horseback and I, and I went. <laughs> And I decided to just spend um, a couple of weeks out there in the Mongolian wilderness, uh, making my way through sort of the, the mountains and the valleys just on horseback, kind of self-supported. And um, that was definitely like the most life-changing journey, part of my whole sort of story. Um, you know, just being completely alone, far away from everybody, um, having to really kind of take care of not just myself, but also these two beautiful animals. That was, um, that trip really changed sort of a lot for me, gave me a lot of confidence also to pursue these bigger adventures out in the wild and the outdoors, uh, which is something that I've now been kind of doing much more of. And um, so, yeah, so I think that's why Mongolia is just a kind of a recurring theme. And the next big thing that I want to do, the next sort of big new thing that I want to try also has to be in Mongolia. It just, you know, the, the whole puzzle kind of comes together at this point. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I mean, it's, it's incredible. Um, as you're speaking, I was like, oh, that's exactly sort of roughly what I want <laughs> to do as well. Take two horses into the wilderness and survive. Totally. Sounds so Honest the most it was the scariest most mentally and physically and emotionally exhausting thing I ever did in my life but also um, the most memorable beautiful and life-changing thing I did in my life I mean there's a sort of theme um, where you know you've Pakistan Yemen um, I know other places like Iraq and always sort of pushing yourself a little bit further had there and you show a very sort of positive light. Have there been moments of trouble in those two or three years? Because you do put yourself in a very vulnerable position. Um, as a solo female traveler, a lot of uh, people imagine that I probably have these kind of horror stories to tell almost on a daily basis and that my life is quite risky and a lot happens that's very dramatic. But honestly, not much happens that is very dramatic, <laughs> at least not in sort of bad ways. In three years of travel, as I've made my way to some of the world's um, sort of most misunderstood countries, I've really, um, I could probably count on the fingers of one hand, um, the sort of the, I would say, I guess, bad things or scary things that happened. I would say that um, the scariest kind of recurring thing that definitely happens is when I camp alone. So when I'm completely alone in a tent in a place that I don't know where there's nobody around me that I know um, as a woman that's that's the situation that makes me feel always the most vulnerable and whether that's in Mongolia or in Saudi Arabia or in Romania or in Poland it's the feeling is always the same and it's the feeling of you know kind of being yeah um, you know a potential threat essentially and um, there's so many stories that I heard from fellow female travelers who feel pretty much the exact same way. Camping out there alone is one of the scariest things that you can do as a woman. Um, and it doesn't really compare really to anything else that I've experienced. Um, there hasn't been, there haven't been any stories of um, harassment or anything like that. Just that like that fear of, of being alone in a tent. It's a scary one, man. <laughs> Do you, so you sort of feel it's the sort of fear of the unknown of something could happen rather than something has actually happened? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's like the, um, you know, we 
um, I think as as women camping alone, we're definitely it's we're sort of easy targets almost. And again, you know, firsthand, I've heard so many different stories from women who have you know really had to kind of protect themselves and had to leave their campsites because someone. Uh, a stranger approached their tent, having figured out that they're alone, and you know started making small talk conversation. That's not that's not what you want in the evening in a place where you're completely alone in a place that you don't know. You don't want someone, you know, anyone coming up to you and making small talk at that point. Um, so yeah, I would say that that's probably you know that's what makes you feel really like scared and vulnerable. And um, again, as as much as I always want to empower women to you know go out there and and sort of travel on their own and explore the world on their own and i really believe that um the world is much much safer than we think um it's just those kind of moments um that you know where you're like oh shit maybe i'm actually what, what, what would i do in a situation like that what would i do if someone approached me right now there's not much that you can do right so um, yeah, that's that's the one thing I, I would say that scares me, and that has been like not a horror story, but um, something that I think about a lot in terms of like fear and threats. Do you, do you, does it get better the more you do it? In terms of, I remember when I was doing my first trip across America, and of course, I mean even now I sort of look back and wondered why people were giving me these horror stories of America. And so the first few times wild camping in America, I was absolutely terrified. Um, and then after about, you know, the fourth time, you suddenly just get used to it. And then by the, you know, the eighth or ninth, you're like, right, let's go and find a really exciting spot. And it's sort of more of the challenge of finding a really cool spot to look out yeah. to and unzip the tent in the morning to look out on a sort of glorious view. <laughs> honestly like i would say for me it doesn't necessarily get better it probably depends on what kind of person you are and like you know what you concentrate on in those moments um for me it doesn't really get better uh, but i do think that you get more savvy so um in the sense that the fear is always there a little bit but i've become smarter about you know choosing my locations for example i would never camp um alone in a place where someone could see me quite easily from um a, the road or from you know a, tr a track or, or a trail or something like that or a path um uh, but really kind of um having learned to you know pick locations where i am the least um in view where i'm really hidden away and also you kind of end up picking up some you know tricks along the way that help you kind of cope with at least making it seem like you're not the only person in the tent like i think one of the best tricks that i've picked up along the way is to put two pairs of shoes outside of your tent so that people think that you're like a couple or two people you know um so yeah maybe it doesn't get less intense for me it's just I can find ways to kind of rationalize it a little bit better and be smarter about planning where I stay and how to stay safe. Well, Ava, I mean, you have some incredible stories. And for anyone who's interested, Ava has quite the following on YouTube and Instagram. And as I've been saying all throughout, tells it in such an amazing and authentic way. Um, but there's a part of the show where we ask the same five questions to each guest each week, with the first being on your trips and expeditions, what's the one gadget that you always take with you? Um, I should probably at this point sort of plug in all the brands that I work with <laughs> on my <laughs> camera gear. But uh, there's actually one thing that is always, always, always with me and it makes for the best gift for my friends. And, you know, people always laugh at me when they find out what it is. Um, I have these this pair of socks that are made from Mongolian camel wool and they are the warmest socks in the entire world and I bring them absolutely everywhere. They are always in my pack and they're the best thing in the world because you know after like a full day of hiking all you want to do is just get in your sleeping bag and then you get cold feet. No, 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 no. Not with these socks. <laughs> so they're like, uh, you know, they cost like two dollars. Bought them at a Mongolian, you know, bazaar somewhere in Ulaanbaatar. And that's that's the gadget I will take everywhere with me. What is your favorite adventure or travel book? There's there's a lot of really fantastic ones. And I was thinking about this earlier. And the problem that I have with a lot of travel books is that a lot of them are like, really outdated and they use like language and descriptions of the world that where I'm like cringing 
<laughs> not all of them, but but some of them definitely do. Um, so I find that like it's difficult for me also sometimes to relate to a lot of those books because a lot of them were not written by people like me, as in like you know girls who are just kind of getting started on their journeys. So there was there was one book that I did read like maybe six months ago, and that really got me thinking about life and kind of what I want to do in slightly different new ways. And that's a book called Woman in the Wilderness by um, a girl called Miriam Lancewood. She's a very sort of romantic name. Um, and uh, it's a book uh, which tells the story of how Miriam and her husband decided to live a life off the grid in New Zealand and decided to kind of learn to hunt and forage and live in the mountains completely on their own. And it's a really beautiful tale. Um, it's very simple, but really, really nice and beautiful and quite inspiring in the sense that it shows you that you can live a beautiful, bountiful life with very, very little. And that it is actually possible to live outside of the system in the wilderness. And um, I, I mean, I, I'm not going to reveal any secrets here, but the, that book definitely inspired me to like think about my future in some kind of new different way so let's see what happens <laughs> amazing and are you thinking of writing a book about your travels um yes <laughs> yes <Is> that, <laughs> it's a, it's is a very that shy camp? yes <laughs> <laughs> i should say yes hell yes um yes um i mean is, actually is that to keep the publisher happy of like no keep it quiet for now or is that <laughs> <laughs> no but if if you're listening and if you're if you work for uh, penguin or random house please let me know get in touch hey at avazimic.com uh, <laughs> harper collins <laughs> yeah um actually yes i mean i i haven't started uh but it's in the works for hopefully this summer writing a book is something that um i've always wanted to do my entire life um and i think i finally found the kind of uh the foundation for it let's say would it be based upon your travels and countries or would it be about your personal experiences you're asking too many questions Sorry, I, i'm just interested <laughs> <laughs> um honestly we will see um i'm just uh, gonna okay. have to start writing and see how it develops i have a few ideas in mind but you know with these things i mean a book is much bigger than like a, a youtube video right so um it's gonna take a little bit more planning and a little bit more perseverance but i hope you read it i hope you like it <laughs> well let me know well uh we'll see when it comes out <laughs> when it's published by Penguin. <laughs> yeah. Hey at avazubek.com. <laughs> Get in touch. <laughs> um, why are adventures important to you? I think adventures are important because they kind of take you out of your comfort zone. They take you out of your sort of away from your cushy, comfortable sofa in your nice, comfy house in whatever city you live in. And they show you that you could actually live a very different kind of life that's not the only reality that you can live and that living comfortably is not necessarily living fully um, and I love that kind of that discrepancy that you know you don't need to go to Everest you don't need to go to the North Pole to experience that you can literally just leave your house and go to the nearest sort of trail go to the forest go to the mountain and have that experience of you know being in a completely new setting where you may not be super comfortable but you really experience that sense of being alive which i think is so rare because we are just so like um you know surrounded by all these comforts by all these um you know everything is kind of prepared for us in advance everything is arranged organized planned um so it's very easy to lose yourself in that and kind of go through life almost um without thinking about you know being alive and the feeling of being alive and what it actually means but isn't that like the essence of being human and, and, and being alive and living and existing. Um, so yes, I think adventures are, are that, you know, um, for me at least, getting out of that comfort zone and really experiencing the sense of being alive. Very nice. What about your favorite quote? That's another one I was thinking about. And <laughs> there's like, how can you, like, how can I say there's only one quote? There's so many that I love and that I feel like define me in so many different ways. You but, can read um, off a few. <laughs> all right, cool. So, so for, I'll start with my tattoos. So I have okay. a tattoo on my foot, which I got when I was 18. Uh, very silly, but actually I still deeply believe in it. And it's in French, but the translation is um, the infinite is. Basically kind of um, making me think 
think of the infinite possibilities, the infinite potential that each one of us holds and that hopefully, you know, um, I hold as well in some way, in some small way, in my little micro universe. Then there's um, a quote that I have on my wrist, which says, I am the storm. And I picked this up from some running book, actually. And I just thought it's so fucking cool. Um, you know, I am the storm. Oh my God, like brings you in the like a uh, sort of place of power. And then the other day I was reading um, a book of poetry by Rumi and I love Rumi. And there was this one quote that I thought was just so appropriate at this time in my life. And it said, your boundaries are your quest. And with all these like adventures, any kind of pursuits um, that we have, whether it's endurance sports or travel or extreme travel or even going hiking or doing something outside of our comfort zone, this idea of your boundaries being your quest is like, you know, it's like almost you, like you have to go and seek your boundaries. You have to go and seek your limits. That's the whole purpose of it all. And yeah, I really love that idea. So that's kind of, that's recently been um, on my mind quite a lot. Uh, it's a good one. I, I like the storm. That's uh, a very sort of powering, sort of gives a uh, sort of whole sort of new meaning to this way. Especially when I'm trying to run up a hill and I'm like really struggling. Oh my God, how much how much longer? And then I look at my wrist and I'm like, I am the storm, aren't I? <laughs> Keep going. And so you're there go. wanting to break down. You're like, okay, I am. Oh God. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I tattooed it into my skin. Surely I am. <laughs> <laughs> so there's your only two tattoos? Uh, I have three. Uh, so like one big one on my... Uh, on my arm, my forearm, then one on my foot, and then one on my neck, sort of like in the back, which is a moon, a star and a moon, a uh, sun and a moon, um, kind of, yeah, sort of nature opposites, all that symbolism, you know. <laughs> I think um, I think it's in sort of South America where they sort of say that tattoos. Every time you get a tattoo, it's like meant to represent a little part of your life. Yes. So the one that I have actually on my forearm, um, that is kind of like a painting of my life a little bit in the sense that, um, you know, it kind of, um, you'd have to see it, but like it kind of weaves its way up my arm through like sort of a path in the mountains, um, path in the sky, sort of roots symbolizing this idea of like being sort of rooted on, in the world, but not really bound anywhere. Um, it's got um, the Socotri dragon blood tree, which is a, a symbol of, so of, the, of the island of Socotra, which, you know, I mean, it's a big part of my life by now. It's got um, an image of the heart, of the moon, of the stars. So all these sort of things that, um, you know, natural elements, um, these emotional elements that I kind of weave into my work and my travels, um, that's kind of all on here. And hopefully this tattoo will also evolve um, in the future and it won't just end at my elbow, but we'll kind of keep going. More stories to add. Always. <laughs> People listening are always keen to travel and go on these sort of grand adventures what would you recommend for people wanting to get started? I think it's very easy to kind of get lost in this idea that, um, you know, influencers and adventurers, whatever you want to call them, um, that they just kind of have this gift or something. There's something special that makes them kind of capable of going on these adventures because it always looks so easy, right? We always make it look so easy. Like, oh, no, no, like I'm just, oh, I've just like strolled up Mount Everest. You know, I'm here taking some selfies. Like, no, that's not the reality. Like most, um, in terms of like most content won't show you the struggles and the challenges. And if it does, it'll show you the struggles and challenges in a nice, pretty way. But the reality is that this stuff is hard. Like it's always a struggle. You know, it's always difficult. We just don't show that part. So don't believe, you know, people when they when they sort of show that it's it was easy. It's always hard. But that's kind of the point of it um, is overcoming those challenges, overcoming your struggles through your, you know, whatever sort of physical strength, but also I think especially mental strength. And um, I think it's important to kind of keep that in mind that it's never as easy as it seems. There will be challenges and you just have to embrace them. That's part of the journey. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Uh, finally, what are you doing now and how can people find you and follow your travels and adventures in the future? 
Of course, as we've already mentioned, there's the ultra marathon that's coming up this summer, which is my first ultra marathon. So I'm really excited, scared, nervous, panicked. I mean, you know, just the whole thing, the whole shebang. Um, so you can definitely follow along on that adventure on Instagram and on YouTube. And then hopefully this summer, um, I also get to do some um, really epic mountain trekking in Central Asia. And then, uh, you know, maybe some climbing as well. Let's see. Uh, but a lot of really, really beautiful places that are really off the tourist radar uh, coming up, including my own personal struggles, suffering, challenges, joys and triumphs, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so that's all. That's all on my channels. Is that in Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan? Correct. Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan. Um, if Russia opens up, then hopefully also in Russia. Um, but yeah, well, a... towards the sort of Georgian side, or exactly, yeah, in the Caucasus. Ah, oh, amazing! Well, I look forward to uh, checking that out when that happens. All right, <laughs> hopefully not too many, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. No, well, you're doing a lot of training now, aren't you? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> not not just winging it. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time in my life, I feel like I'm actually doing something, you know, very disciplined, and it's a great <laughs> feeling. Definitely gives you the confidence that you can actually, you know, you can actually persevere. Yeah. Well, Ava, thank you so much for coming on today. You have some incredible stories. And as for people listening, go check out her YouTube and Instagram, which will be in the description. And, you know, it's an absolute joy to watch. <laughs> thank you so much. It was such a pleasure. Well, that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you got something out of it. If you did, hit that like button and subscribe if you haven't already. And I will see you in the next video.